the question is, am I, am, is this going to be a tough search to find somebody who, you know, a college student who's using smart drugs? <laughs> I, would, I would think just the opposite. It seems like. So, oh, I mean, people... somebody who would talk about it, though. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. This is a special overdose edition. This is not going to be the regular Friday episode. If you're downloading it in real time, then you happen to notice today is not Friday. And so this is like an in-between episode that's coming at you between episodes number 136 and 137. 137 will be due out in just a couple of days. Wanted to sneak this one in the middle first because I got an email yesterday that I wanted to share with you guys in pretty short order. That little snippet of conversation that you heard at the head of the show, that was actually a conversation that took place based on that email. But let me actually tell what this episode is going to be about. So a while ago, I did an interview with Dr. Roger Staff from the University of Aberdeen in the UK and a study that he's involved with, which is a very, very longitudinal study. Longitudinal means takes place over the course of a long period of time. In this case, we're talking like 70 years that data from this study has been being collected. And one of the things that they're looking at is the changes in intelligence that take place both over people's lifetimes and also between cohorts, between groups of people that are born sequentially to one another. Because there's something very interesting we've talked about before on an episode or two, but never really gone into detail on it, called the Flynn Effect, which is the strange, counterintuitive, but generally good news finding that people seem to be getting smarter decade by decade at a rate which is pretty incredible, pretty surprising. So I did this interview with Professor Staff. It came out a little bit shorter than our normal interviews, and it didn't feel quite full-fledged enough to make into an episode unto itself, but we had it on the shelf. I didn't want to let it fall by the wayside, and so we decided that we'd slip it in this week as an overdose edition, which is what you're listening to now. So in just a second, with no pre preamble with no This Week in Neuroscience or any of the normal wraparound stuff. We're going to go straight into the interview with Professor Roger Staff. Keep it short and sweet. But the reason that this is happening now and not a week from now or a month from now or whenever is because of this email that I got and the subsequent phone call that I had that I wanted to let you guys know about soon. I was reached out to by a major network, major television network in the U.S. I'm not supposed to say exactly who it is, but it's one of the big ones. And they're putting together a show that they're working pretty quickly to get together and actually start shooting. A documentary style, interview style, show with real people, and they're going to be talking about smart drugs, looking at it from all different potential angles, people that have good things to say, people that have bad things to say, people that think it's ethical, unethical, safe, dangerous, and specifically one of the things that they're looking for are some college-age students, preferably college undergrads, that have used smart drugs in the past or are still using smart drugs now. You don't need to have any particular opinion on the topic, you just need to have an opinion on the topic and have some personal experience. So wanted to hustle this quick little episode out, let you guys know that this was happening, and if you or somebody that you know fit this criteria, you'd be interested in being on television, and they say, by the way, that if, if somebody wants confidence confidentiality for any reason, they can digital out their face and voice and, you know, have you seated in a shadow so you look like a silhouette or something like that. All of those things are possible. I think they would prefer to have somebody fully on camera, but it sounds like they're open for whatever. So anyway, if this sounds like it's of interest to you, shoot me an email. My email is jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com. That's J-E-S-S-E. And I will get you connected to the producer for that show. So that's that. Cool little opportunity. Just wanted to put this out there. They are going to be shooting in the U.S., so they prefer somebody in the continental United States. But other than that, and being age bracketed around college undergrads. They didn't sound terribly picky. So there's the little news item. But now let's shift and go into this short, sweet informational interview talking about the Flynn effect with Professor Roger Staff. The Flynn effect is named after Professor Flynn at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He wasn't really the first to observe it, but they've named it after him anyway. It essentially looks at uh, intergenerational intelligence, how we are improving in terms of our intelligence, particularly over the 20th and 21st century. So as a species, we appear to be getting smarter, particularly in the Western world, or that's where the evidence lies. Obviously, in developing nations and in the third world, there's, there's less evidence, although one would expect the Flynn effect to occur in developing nations as well. So but essentially, it boils down to us improving by about three to four IQ points per decade and general cognitive testing. So essentially, that's what Flynn observed in the 80s. And we had the unique opportunity of looking at it in the same cohort, in the same group of people when they were 11 and when they were in their late 60s as well. And that's my main research interest is, is plotting this cohort's life course. 
you just did another follow-up study recently, just in 2015. Is that correct? Yeah, we did another round of data collecting. In terms of it's a follow-up study, you can describe it as a 70-year follow-up study. So every child in Scotland had their IQ tested aged 11 on June the 1st, 1947. And Aberdeen, it's the oil capital of Europe. And it's been quite buoyant, although it's not buoyant at the moment. It's been quite buoyant in terms of financial prosperity. So people haven't moved away. So you can track these individuals that were born here and raised here here and had their whole entire working life here. And that's what the Aberdeen Birth Cohort is about, is about tracking them across their life course. Now, have your findings within the Aberdeen cohort population, has that lined up pretty well with your expectations based on the broader trends of the Flynn effect as seen around the world? Yes, the age 11 IQ difference was about what we expected, three to four IQ points, which is what we expected. But when we tested them in later life, and there's two cohorts, one born in 21 and one born in 36, and that's where we've got this comparison in terms of intelligence growth. It was greater than expected, quite significantly. So we're looking at 10 to 12 IQ points. That just such an amazing statistic. What are some of the speculated upon reasons that people think might be behind this growth? Okay, so if you look at those born in 1921, they grew up in the Depression, and the Depression was in the UK as well as in, in North America. So they grew up during the Depression. There's a shortage of food, if you like. Calorie-rific intake was very limited. Whereas those born in 1936, they grow up during the war, the immediate post-war period. Now, during that period, rationing was introduced in the, in the UK. There was a set number of calories you were entitled to as an individual. And although it wasn't very exciting in terms of food, it was calorific. It was probably an improvement on those born in 1921. Right. So I think they were better nourished. Welfare state starts in the immediate post-war period. So they were better nourished. They were better educated. The NHS is formed in 1948. So they were looked after from cradle to grave, or hopefully that being one of the mantras of the NHS. So I think they just led a better life. So that uptrend in, in food availability and quality food, I mean, that, that sort of has a ceiling to it. Should we expect these sorts of positive changes to be time localized? Like, would we expect a similar amount of changes, let's say, between a cohort from 1960 and 1980? Yeah, you can have the argument that the diet, are now, diet now is poorer than it was, you know, in a sense that excessive calorific intake in some cases. So you could argue that the gains to be had by the nutritional standard, they've probably reached the ceiling effect. I'm sure there must be similar studies going on with much younger cohorts, people that have been born more recently. Do you know about any of those studies that might have happened in the results that we have there? Broadly across the literature, the general feeling is these gains are slowing down, yes. That's in the Western world. Whereas in developing nations, these gains are as strong as they've been observed in the mid 20th century. I've recently looked at socioeconomic position across the life course. My main interest in it is in the aging brain and how we decline and how we maintain our cognition in late life. One of the arguments is you have the early life causes, causes of late life diseases, and that's been shown in cardiology by uh, Professor Barker. And it's known as the Barker hypothesis in as much that you lay down your resilience to aging in early life. And we've looked at socioeconomic position across the life course. And in general, the richer tend to be more healthy. That's observed right across all spectrums of society. Yeah. But what we found is that being richer doesn't really affect your cognitive cognitive trajectory. It merely affects being from a higher social strata, having a better job, more challenging experiences during life, affects where you came in at, not your trajectory of decline. So there's no real difference between being from a high or low social strata in terms of the trajectory of decline. But there is a difference in terms of cognition, where you came at, your peak cognition, if you like. That sounds like it could just have a ton of competing variables, the things like the differences in nutrition that you mentioned, but also educational availability and things like that. Well, if you speak to a sociologist, they would say that access to education is a socioeconomic phenomena. It's not really driven by your intelligence per se. It's driven by the expectation of education. Right. The types of intelligence growth that we've seen, is this sort of a broad spectrum across the board? Or have we seen, for example, more growth in mathematical skills than we have in verbal skills or vice versa? One of the problems of doing longitudinal cognitive examinations of, of this type is people get better. They get better by practice. Yeah. yeah. And that sort of hides in any, can hide any decline in, in cognition. So the number of tests that we've tried, and in the Flynn Effect paper, we've actually modeled how they might improve with practice. 
So you can test it in all sorts of cognitive domains, you know, speed of processing, executive function, memory. There are lots of different domains. But by and large, you get the same findings right across the cognitive spectra. And I guess that makes a lot of good sense if one of the primary drivers of this seems to be access to quality foods, because that seems like it would be affecting things at a pretty low level physiologically. Not, not that it's a low level effect, but that it's something that's physiologically fundamental. Yeah, very much so. You wouldn't be you know, a specific food for a specific cognitive domain, I don't think, it's yeah. in that sense. But we've been doing some recent work with information processing speed, and essentially it will probably underpin all of the other cognitive domains in a, in a broad access type of way you are slowing down in late life and that's what we're trying to test and that will affect everything else you do like that clock speed on a computer exactly yeah you had some data on whether the risk of dementia late in life had correlation to childhood intelligence i'd love to hear about that Part of our work is been looking at the cognitive reserve hypothesis in, in a sense that is there anything you can do throughout your life course before you become vulnerable to dementia and decline that protects you from dementia? An example of that is you can look at two brain scans and they could have equal amounts of Alzheimer's-like burden. But one will be functioning normally and one will be scoring very low on all of the type of scores that we have. And when you examine the potential reasons for that, again, it comes back to education and occupation being the investors in cognitive reserve. Now, these are not protecting you from the accumulation of the pathology, but they are allowing you to compensate for it. And what do we see as the mechanism of action to allow for that compensation? Or is that something that we can get from the data? Well, we know what the proxies are, you know, typical intellectual engagements, reading, taking part in group activities, having a good social life. So although we've not created a brain-wide metric that says, well, you have X amount of reserve and we're measuring it right. physically, we do know what's correlated with this ability to compensate. It would be nice if we did have a metric with a high order chronic activity fMRI scans of the brain or flexibility studies or entropy studies. And there are all sorts of high-end signal processing metrics you can pull out. But do they allow you to compensate? And that's that's an unknown at the moment. Right. Although it would be really interesting. It could be really scary to know, oh, well, you've got five years left of your intellectual life before you start falling off the cliff. That might almost be better not to know. Yes. We can measure the burden. We can measure amyloid. We can measure tau now, the whole set of tau ligands coming on. We can measure atrophy. We can measure connectivity in terms of how various parts of your brain are connected. We can measure all sorts of things, but the relationship between the imaging appearance and the clinical appearance or the cognitive appearance, there's still a big wide gap between that and we don't know how to map one onto the other. Yeah. Brain imaging data is so much easier to come by than it used to be, but there's still the big challenge of trying to process everything and make sense of it. Well, projects like ADNI, although they're very much disease specific, they tell you a lot about the normal aging brain as well. You know, this data is, is available to us all. And if we have a neat idea about what might be associated with decline in a normal population or, say, a mild cognitively impaired population, you can go to the data and go and test your hypothesis rather than start acquiring your own data. And that's been a real strength in the field over the last 10 to 15 years. So if you go into a cardiologist now, you could expect them to say something like, great job, you're 40 years old, but you have the heart of a 25-year-old, or, or vice versa, you know, you're 40 years old, but you have the heart of a 70-year-old cigarette smoker who's been mainlining Crisco. How far do you think we are from having something analogous to the brain, where they could say your calendar age is this, but biologically your brain age is such and such? I think in some sense, it's just in terms of atrophy, you can say, well, your brain looks as though you're 10 or 15 years older than you actually are. So it depends what you mean by looks like, you know, how much burden have you got? So if we could do a PET scan on measuring amyloid burden or measuring tau burden, again, the variable that cognitive reserve throws in is not necessarily a sentence. Yeah. We know what an average brain looks like, but none of us have average brains. They're all unique to ourselves. So to answer your question, if I put you in an MRI scanner and give you a brain aging metric, the simplest one being what's the ratio of your brain size to your head size, for example. And that's been shown to predict death, survival. So it's another risk factor of many risk factors that we have. 
I keep thinking about it. How, how do we reconcile the Flynn effect with the fact that there's historically there's been very, very smart humans ever since we've had recorded history, probably further back than that. But I guess the conventional wisdom is that we're looking at it more or less a time isolated phenomenon here. And there's no reason to think that we've been gaining intelligence at this remarkable level for century after century after century. Well, generation by generation, you are possibly smarter than your parents, but on average, you will be definitely smarter than your grandparents in terms of unique culturally independent tests. And it's important to note this is not evolution. The time frame is too short to be evolution. It's us exploiting or being able to exploit the potential of the brain. Your point, though, about my generation being on average smarter than my parents' generation, on average smarter than my grandparents' generation, that's not a trend that we would expect to continue ongoing into the past. This seems like it's probably closely enough tied to the availability of rich, nutritious food sources that this multiple points of IQ gain per decade would certainly not be in a long time trajectory. The question I think you need to ask is if my grandparents were born on the same day as I, then would they be smarter than me? If they were exposed to the same environmental conditions, then they will probably be as smart as you. It's not evolution. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Professor Staff for taking the time for that interview. The Flynn Effect is one of those things, it's hard to believe that that's true, but it, it makes you really, really glad to live in the time that we live in now, where you have to assume that we're probably getting pretty close to the ceiling of our genetic potential if we've really been picking up IQ at three to four points per decade, because that just, it seems like an unsustainable rate, and it seems like we must have just started doing these IQ measurements around the time that this uptrend really started, because you can you can read books by people written 500 years ago, I mean, they, they weren't dummies back then. Some of them were, but not everybody. And when you think about this, in IQ tests, a standard deviation is generally 15 points. So if the average IQ is 100, then two thirds of people are supposed to be within 15 points, either upwards or downwards of 100. So between 85 and 115 IQ, you're supposed to have two thirds of the population. But if the Flynn effect is really changing things at three to four IQ points per decade, that's only 40 or 50 years to move a whole standard deviation. So what that would be saying is that somebody born in the middle of the pack 50 years ago, smack dab at the 50th percentile, they would have five out of six people born 50 years later smarter than them, which is really, really something. I mean, so you could see how this rate wouldn't continue to go backwards multiple centuries, or otherwise in like the 1700s, people would have had the average IQ of a muskrat. I mean, no, nobody is saying that's the case. But Flynn Effect, super interesting. That is all for this overdose edition. I'll be back at you with your regularly scheduled Smart Drug Smarts episode number 137 in just a couple of days. But thanks for listening. If you like this one, spread it around in all the normal ways on social media, tweets, shares, Facebook likes, whatever it might be. All very much appreciated, and I'll see you back here in just a couple of days. Until then, stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only, although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not, and the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.